Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Camille's Harem. <laughs> Not just a podcast for novice writers by novice writers, but also a YouTube channel by novice writers for novice writers. Because writing is an adventure. It's more fun with friends, especially in the spooky month of Halloween. And that is actually what I want to talk about in today's video. I want to talk about using Halloween as a setting for our stories. And this all kind of began with a question. It is a question that a lot of us have asked ourselves throughout our entire lives. What is the best? What is the best cereal? What is the best pizza? What is the best place to go on vacation? What is the best movie to see right now in theaters? What is the best use of my time? What is the best cryptocurrency to be scammed by? So on and so forth. <laughs> we always want to know what is the best. And this originally started off as, well, what is the best Halloween movie or the best Halloween story, the best Halloween-centered show? And the fact of the matter is that, well, you can't really definitively answer that question because it's so subjective. Everyone is going to have their own opinions of what makes a really great Halloween movie. And I'm not just talking about the Halloween franchise. I'm talking about any movie that uses the celebration of Halloween as a setting for what is going on. Or maybe that is the story shenanigans during the night of Halloween, whatever it be. So because that is a question that I can't really answer in a way that I think would be very fulfilling or very beneficial to you, instead, this led me down a journey of, okay, well then how can we best use Halloween as a setting for our stories? That is, if you want to set a story during Halloween, or if you're writing a much larger story and Halloween happens to come up in the timeline, how can you best utilize the celebration of Halloween to enhance the experience within your story? So as I was thinking about this, I came up with five different elements that you need to utilize in order to make the most of a Halloween setting. I'm going to tell you right off the bat what these five elements are, and then I'm actually going to be giving you a history lesson, breaking down how these five elements play into that, and then I will look at some examples of how Halloween has best been used and misused to tell a story. So starting off first with these five elements, the five elements are, well, duh, horror. Yes, <laughs> horror must be an element of any Halloween storytelling that you do or of any Halloween setting. There needs to be an element of horror. So horror, then you need to have levity. Yes, levity, hilarity, jokes, moments of releasing the tension. Levity must be part of the story. Number three food. Number four, family or friends, family slash friendship. And then lastly, you need to have reckless abandon. In order to understand these five different elements, we need to take a look at the history of Halloween. And this is something that I know I'm going to really enjoy and I need to make sure I don't get into some long-winded lecture right here because, well, as a trained historian and as someone who teaches history as his full-time job, this is something that I love getting into, especially because Halloween, as opposed to something like Christmas or Easter, even St. Patrick's Day, Halloween does not have a good documented history to it. Yes, there are a ton of people who be like, well, Lars, it's this old Irish celebration, this old Celtic celebration. And yes, that is true, but there's actually a whole lot more to it. And Halloween is weird because it kind of comes and goes in these strange blips. And it's very, very hard to connect these different blips in order to understand how Halloween has evolved over the millennia and how it has become what it is today, which is very central to the five themes that I've given you, the five elements that you need in order to best utilize Halloween as a setting within your story. All right, so let me quickly explain. As far as we know it, the history of Halloween. The thing is this, while it's true that kind of the core of Halloween dates back to the Celtic festival of Samhain, there are actually many, many different cultures that have added to what Samhain became over 
the course of many, many centuries. The Romans contributed to it. The Spanish contributed to it. Um, later on, as you have um, Native American and Spanish culture mixing, what then becomes uh, Mexican culture also contributes to what Halloween has become. There are tons and tons of different places around the world that have contributed their own little bit to what we understand Halloween to be today. So we can't just credit Samhain as being the uh, as being the the beginning of Halloween because as we trace Halloween as best we can throughout the throughout the ages uh, many many different cultures have loved this idea and have celebrated this idea of the living and the dead merging on a particular night however in this instance I'm going to focus primarily on Samhain so the ancient Celts they celebrated a very interesting time of the year at the end of the harvest season as the bounties and life of fall transition into the cold death of winter you have a particular night you have the fall equinox when the worlds of the living and the dead meet this is something that you can actually find prevalent across many, many different beliefs and cultures all around the world. But here, for the Celts, what they would do is they would celebrate this particular night by taking the bounties of their recent harvest and sharing them with the spirits of those who had departed before. These are their dead ancestors, as well as the spirits of different monsters, deities, and even of dearly departed animals, all coming to enjoy the bounties of the harvest. Now, because this is a time when the worlds of the living and the dead merge, what they would do is they would light fires where the living would congregate because within the shadows was where the spirits of the dead and of the monsters were. And they would dress themselves up as animals and act with reckless abandon, acting like animals, so that way they would not be recognized as humans and be potentially attacked as the shadows increase roach upon their feast and then they would feast with the dearly departed and enjoy this crazy night of revelry it's kind of the last time that you can really enjoy yourself before the world transitions and the leaves fall and the trees become barren the grass becomes brown and hard and everything becomes cold as winter sets in this is a very unique, very fun, very dangerous, crazy celebration. Now, this celebration underwent many different kinds of transformations. The Romans, as the Romans brushed up against the Celts and tried to conquer the Celts, the Romans actually incorporated Samhain as part of their own traditions and tried to Romanize it, which they were only partially successful. Later on, as the Catholic faith took over the Roman Empire, they too would try their hand at subduing Samhain, and they would introduce... All Hallows Eve. This is a time rather than to celebrate the dearly departed spirits of animals and ancestors and all different kinds of monsters. No, we're going to remember the saints on this day. And so you then have the people of Ireland and England who would go to church, but then when they were done with church, they would go and they would slip back into their ancient festivals. Later on, as there became a distinct divide between the English and the Irish, the English tried repeatedly to crush the Irish identity and the Irish culture. This included attacks on all people who celebrated Samhain, which led to Samhain being celebrated in the backwoods, in secret. And as the Irish immigrated on over to the Americas, they brought these traditions on over with them and would still celebrate Samhain kind of on the periphery it was this dangerous weird mystical thing and the americans took notice because the americans were very prejudiced towards the irish just like the english were however they were also mystified by these strange traditions and they slowly began to catch on especially for the children because as we go into the late 1800s and early 1900s, life really sucks for a lot of kids. Kids don't have the kind of life that they enjoy today. There is no social media. There's no hanging out with friends. Most kids are not going to school. Most kids are working, and they're working in 
horrible conditions and their living conditions are often not much better. And so many kids, especially many teenagers, began to adopt these crazy Irish traditions. And on the special night of All Hallows Eve, they would slip into the woods or slip into back alleys and they would celebrate with reckless abandon one crazy night where they could forget all of their troubles and woes. This then evolved into crazy parties where these teens and kids would go from house to house at ransacking houses, trying to burn them down. They would rip off furniture, they'd rip away porches, they would shatter windows, steal stuff, and then have a massive bonfire in the middle of the street. This was a time that was particularly dangerous, and police would be sent in to try to break it up, so you'd have teens fighting against police while setting the neighborhood on fire. There's some crazy shenanigans going down, and so the Americans branded what they called Halloween as this evil tradition, which the moment that you tell any teenager that they're not allowed to do something, well, of course they're going to do it. And Halloween just exploded into this crazy phenomena that swept across the nation and had people quaking in their boots whenever October 31st rolled around. Now, this led some community leaders who were pretty savvy to come up with some brilliant ideas for stopping the kids in their attempts to destroy property. They told house owners, have candy, have cookies, have something that when the teens come to attack your house, you present them with the goodies and you tell them here, don't attack my house, take the candy, take the cookies, take the cake, go somewhere else and have your bonfire. And so the teens started going from house to house to house saying, give us your treats or we're going to attack your house. This is the inception of a true trick or treat. Now, there have been other cultures that have had similar things. However, this is actually where the American version, which is the ultimate version of trick or treat begins. Teenagers hell-bent on destroying public property, going and holding houses ransom for candy. This is trick or treat. And once it caught on, as teens began to go from house to house to house now every year, demanding treats or they would play a horrible trick on the house, these same leaders, these same community leaders who said, we'll give them candy, now took it a step further. And they said, now that the teenagers are going about getting candy, the little kids should get candy too. So you know what? Dress up with your kids. Go on out there. Go get those sweets. And now that there are adults and little kids everywhere, the teenagers have to fall in line, which they did. Sure, plenty of teens are going out and pulling all different kinds of tricks and shenanigans because that's just what they did. That's just what teenagers do. But it highly tamed Halloween. The ransacking, the burning, the bonfires ceased and gave way to the traditions of trick or treat, of Halloween parties, and of just good fun natured shenanigans and tricks on the 31st of October. Now, Halloween continues to ebb and flow in terms of popularity and interaction and really your own personal experience with Halloween will vary. I myself, I love going trick-or-treating. I mean, I still, as an adult, will go out, hang out with the kids, um, go from door to door, get candy. I've got a crazy story that I'll share at some point about one night where I was the horrific character going around getting candy and I parted the kids like Moses parting the Red Sea in my crazy costume. It was a phenomenal night. So I enjoy trick-or-treating. I've done trick-or-treating almost my entire life long. But not everyone has done that. Not everyone has participated in crazy Halloween parties. For some people, they've gone even further than that. Or for other people, they just prefer to go out and party with their friends. Trick-or-treating, who cares? I don't want to be with the kids. I don't want to be with the family. I just want to be with my friends. Whatever. There are plenty of different interactions that people have had with Halloween. However, what Halloween has become is strangely enough still connected to core themes and ideas that go all the way back to Samhain. This is a crazy night of reckless abandon. It is a night where horror and levity meet, where the worlds of the living and the dead merge, light and darkness, and you walk this crazy line between madness and safety, danger and home, Halloween 
continues to represent a lot of these core ancient ideas. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, Lars, okay, fine. Thank you for the history lesson, as strange as that is, but how does that help me out as a novice writer? Well, here's the thing. Throughout all of re Halloween's recorded history, we can still find these five themes. The horror, the horror that is experienced on this night as living and dead merge, light and darkness, trick or treat. There is something horrific about this particular night, and it has been that way for millennia, and it has been that way for multiple cultures around the world. It is a core theme, but at the same time, another core theme is levity. This wasn't all just cowering by the fire as monsters prowled about in the darkness. No, people enjoyed themselves. It was a time to have fun. So levity. Levity is also something that you desperately need in any kind of horror story. If you just focus on the horrific, you become you create a grim dark story. And grim dark is just depressing. It's actually not scary. What is scary is when you delve into the unknown. The known for most people is way more congenial, way more fun, is full of levity and happiness and horror counters that so you need to have levity and horror play off of each other in any good horror story so horror levity then food Samhain was a feast it was a feast to help celebrate the harvest and the passing of the time of bounty to the time of need and of dark and cold and hunger and still people go about getting treats food is still central to what Halloween has always been. And while we may no longer be feasting on the bounties of our harvest, we're feasting on tons and tons of chocolate and other good sugary sweets that are going to kill us before our time. <laughs> the fourth theme or element is family and friends. During the ancient time of Samhain, you partied it up with the spirits of the dearly departed, your ancestors, your family, and you're with your family as you're celebrating this. And true, we did go through a time where teens are going out and being crazy, but then it was tamed to once again become a family affair. And even then, when the teens were going out and doing their own thing, they're with their friends. Family and friends has always remained a core aspect. Community has always been a core aspect of Halloween. And finally, the fifth one was reckless abandon. During Samhain, you would dance crazy like an animal as you dressed up. You became something else for the night, and we still do that. You either went from the downtrodden worker to the rebellious teen who is just reveling in destruction, or you are the kid who then becomes a skeleton for the night. People dress up as pirates, princesses, goblins, ghouls, ghosts, werewolves, vampires. For one night, they become something other than themselves, and they enjoy themselves with reckless abandon. These five elements have always remained true to Halloween in all of its iterations. Horror, levity, food, family and friends, and reckless abandon. So knowing that we need these five themes, we now need to ask ourselves, okay, well, so as novice writers, how do we incorporate these five themes into a Halloween setting? Now, if you want to have a look at stories that are just really, really good, that focus primarily on a Halloween story itself, you can go and you can look at stuff like The Nightmare Before Christmas, Hoobie Halloween, Hocus Pocus, Nightmares. These are all excellent stories that just, they focus in on a Halloween setting and deliver the goods on all five elements and just tell a really great transformational story of characters developing during this crazy time of the year. It's really, really good. And so if you are looking to write a story that's just set primarily on October 31st, then watch or read stuff like that and pull some inspiration. When you incorporate those five themes, those five themes help to create this setting where things are fun, but they're also dark, where people are defined by the relationships that they have with 
others, the fun that they have, whether they are an outcast finding friends as they go about pulling tricks rather than getting treats, or the bullied kid who finally finds where he or she belongs as they go about from house to house, or learning that, hey, you know what, it would be really fun to go out with my friends tonight, but instead I'm going to spend time with my siblings and we're just going to enjoy watching horror movies as we pass out candy. Like, whatever it be, you have these moments where you are building up people within a community, family or friends. The horror aspects, ooh, you can lean into any one of these themes to do what you want to do. If you want to make it a more terrifying story or a more funny story or a story about family, friends, a story about getting really sick because you're eating way too much candy, whatever it be. You have to, though, use these elements because if you're missing any one of these five elements along the way, your story will be noticeably lacking. And I'm gonna show why in at least a couple of examples here in just a moment. But once you have your setting, it needs to be about the character and how your characters evolve during this night. You can have the craziest monsters, you can have the coolest spells, you can have the sweetest candy, but none of that matters if your characters are forgettable and dumb within your story. It is still always going to be about your characters. Now, let's actually have a look at some shows that have used Halloween as a setting to help tell part of their story. Rather than focusing primarily on October 31st, instead they have used Halloween as a passing moment within the grander story, and they use Halloween as a moment to help develop their characters along their journey. One of the really great examples of this has to be from Gravity Falls. And yes, Summerween does not take place during October 31st. It happens right in the middle of the summer. But Summerween is such a fantastic moment within Gravity Falls. If you watch this episode with the Summerween Trickster, you're going to see all five elements at play. You have the horror element. The Summerween Trickster is absolutely terrifying as he looms over the kids, as he dogs Dipper, as he promises to destroy them, to kill them, unless they sate his hunger with candy. He is a fantastic villain, and he is genuinely horrific because he's just, he's such a crazy unknown, and he's always present. Ah. Oh. It's fantastic, but it's also a really hilarious episode. There's a lot of really great gags and jokes throughout it. And I mean, even at one point in the middle of a pretty horrific scene, Zeus calls out, I need some levity. Boom, levity right there. And of course the food, because Dipper and Mabel have to collect 500 pieces of candy in order to placate the Summerween trickster. We then also have family and friends. Dipper wants to ditch Mabel and hang out with Wendy, which is honestly a really great setup, not only because I ship Dipper and, Win Dipper and Wendy, and yeah, I know that sounds really weird, but hey, it is what it is. It's Halloween. Give me a pass. <laughs> Dipper wants to ditch out on family to be with a friend. However, as he comes to learn, Halloween is better with his twin sister, and he even still gets a chance to hang out with friends and later on to hang out with Wendy. So Dipper's journey is marked by his relationships with family and friends. So boom, we have the family and friends aspect and then the reckless abandon, which there are so many great hijinks and shenanigans in this episode and of course dressing up. And this is actually one of the things that's really great about this episode, that Dipper does not want to dress up. But once he finally does, he gets into the spirit of Summerween and he actually has fun. He has embraced the reckless abandon. As such, by embracing all five of these themes and telling a great story of brother and sister enjoying their last Halloween together as kids before they become teenagers and it's no longer cool, it is just, it's great. I dare I say it's perfect. Another great example of utilizing Halloween as a storytelling setting, as using Halloween as a great chance to actually just solidify how much these characters have gone through is in Amphibia. I've already done my review of the episode The Shut-In, but it bears going over again, especially because Amphibia uses Halloween very, very interestingly. In The Shut-In, they are telling horror stories to each other. So we have the horror element to it, and 
genuinely speaking, some of these things are pretty creepy. Like Hot Pops Adventures with Death, while really hilarious, if you if you think about what's actually going on, how like the world of amphibia, what it is, and how Hot Pop has seen quite a bit, and there's foreshadowing to Hot Pop potentially dying later on the series. This is kind of horrifying because it is this reckoning that death comes for us all. You then have Anne and Sprig's stories, which are genuinely creepy. Like, I get goosebumps watching those, even though they're funny little cartoons, because they pull off the horror element very, very well. But there's lots of jokes sprinkled throughout the stories that they tell, and even within the stories that they tell, it's just, it's fantastic. The balance between horror and levity in Amphibious episode Shut In is on point. Now, we come to the food aspect, and this is actually an interesting one right here, because... Food does actually not feature very prominently within this episode. So you could almost fault and say it's missing that one element. It's not really there, but there is a trick-or-treating moment at the beginning of the episode where they are getting supplies to hold themselves over during the night of the blue moon because they have to protect themselves from the horrors that await them outside. This food, the sustenance in this case, are the supplies that they need to tide themselves over for the night. And yes, Anne is also eating some popcorn. <laughs> we then have family and friends. Anne spends time with the planters. This is a moment that helps to solidify that Anne really is part of the planter family. If we remember, she had just left Newtopia, where she was with one of her best friends, Marcy. And she left Marcy, which is a huge moment within the show, to be with the planters because the planters are her family. They are as close to her as her parents are to her. And this is absolutely huge. And this episode just helps to solidify how close Anne and the planters have grown together. So we have the family slash friends aspect to this right here. And then we have the reckless abandon. In, which definitely ties into the story that Sprig tells Skin Deep, which is genuinely creepy, and the prank that he and Ivy pull on, on the entire family is absolutely exquisite, that just dives into this whole reckless abandon, which Polly follows up with by going out into the blue moon to experience horror. She throws caution to the wind, and the results are hilarious and terrifying. So Gravity Falls and Amphibia both use a Halloween setting to help tell a smaller part of a much larger story, but they utilize the Halloween theme thoroughly, really, really well. And I mean, you can just watch these episodes by themselves and enjoy them as Halloween specials. They're just done so freakishly well. But then when you watch them, within the context of the greater show, you see just how fantastic they are as installments within a much greater story. Now, an example of using Halloween the wrong way would be from, surprisingly, Stranger Things. Which is really weird to say because Stranger Things absolutely nailed it in its first season with how it balanced horror and levity. And I personally still really enjoyed the entire series. I know some people say that it's kind of gone downhill after season two, but you know, whatever. We can, we can hash this out. It's one of the reasons why I said it's really hard to tell what is the best Halloween story because everyone has their differing opinion. However, when we get to the episode where the boys have their Halloween fun and shenanigans, it's very, very clear that we're missing certain things. This is a very dark episode. It, de it delivers quite a bit on the horror aspects and uh, will definitely... Woo, that poor kid, he's going through a whole lot. But there's very little levity to balance out the horror. And so we're just kind of left with a rather depressing episode, which is kind of heralded by the fact that no one dresses up for Halloween when they go to school, except for the boys. And they feel like outsiders. And it, it doesn't really fit very well. The Reckless Abandon is kind of gone throughout the episode. And I know that it is trying to capture the idea that the kids are growing up, they're transitioning, but the honest truth is that the entire town is still 
decorated and ready to go for Halloween. It was a very odd choice on the part of the directors and writers to say, hey, guess what? No one else is celebrating Halloween at school because, well, that's just not what would have happened during that time. It was it was more of a reflection of current times where people try to clamp down Halloween at school, say, no, no, kids shouldn't dress up. But it just, it didn't fit. So the reckless abandon element was definitely gone. The levity really isn't there in this episode. Uh, food barely plays a role in this at all, except for just a very brief trick-or-treating moment. And so that aspect is missing. And the boys are all kind of going their separate ways throughout this episode. As a result, it bungles everything except for the horror. As a result, watching the Halloween episode of Stranger Things, it feels more like really old ranch dressing that's being poured onto the meal. And you're like, why is this here? This didn't need to be here. If you're going to use Halloween as a setting, go all into it. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have a full Halloween special for Stranger Things, where for one night it's balls to the walls crazy as the as the upside down tries to attack the kids after they've gone on like this crazy adventure trying to get as much uh, candy as they possibly can and like attack some person's house who they don't like, whatever it, whatever it be. He, like after a night of levity then just plummets into horror. That would have been fantastic. But it's not there. And there's no real camaraderie between the boys and it's just, it's a mess. It's a mess of an episode. And while I can't really speak to any specific example, because there's just really so many of them, go have a look at a lot of shows geared towards specifically like teens from 15 to 16. They're transitioning. Halloween is still there. Like, it's cool to hang out with friends for Halloween, but it's not cool to do trick-or-treating stuff. A lot of those stories focus primarily on the romance aspect of, of the Halloween shenanigans. So there's a lot of focus on levity and friendship or family, but the horror aspect is gone. Food is largely left off to the sidelines and reckless abandon really isn't there because the kids are so self-conscious about what's going on that they don't fully give themselves over to the idea of becoming someone else on this particular night. They might dress up, but they don't get into it. It's just trappings. It's just expected. So they do it, but it doesn't really mean anything. And that's a huge problem. If you're going to use Halloween as a setting, you need to make it mean something. If it's just, if it's just there in the background, kind of keeping the time, like saying, yeah, this is the time of year that we're in, then you might as well have just said, it's Halloween time going on now with everything else. If you're going to use Halloween, if you're really going to use any kind of holiday, like kind of get into it. Because if you're going to mention, if you're going to go through the effort of mentioning it, you might as well make it a thing that's important. Because once again, this is about the characters. And you can tell a lot about a character depending on what kind of holidays they decide to celebrate and how. And while Halloween might not be a day that you get off from work or school, how someone embraces Halloween says a lot about them. And the adventure that they go on for that one night can help develop a lot about their character, whether they reject Halloween or embrace it. And if you just use it as little side trappings, whoop de doo it's Halloween, we're moving on now, it doesn't mean much. All right, so I've been rambling on pretty long by this point, so let's wrap this up. Once again, if you want to make the most of a Halloween setting for your story, if you want to make it the best that you can, because, well, yeah, what is the best Halloween story? Who knows? But you can do your best in utilizing Halloween by focusing on implementing these five elements, however you decide to use them. Horror levity, food, family and friends, and reckless abandon. How you use those five, what you lean into more, how you incorporate them through different monsters, spells, adventures, treats, characters, 
themes, lessons, what have you. If you're able to use all five of these, you will have fully implemented what Halloween has always stood for in its many iterations. And as such, it will resonate with your audience more because they will be fully sucked in to these Halloween hijinks and shenanigans. And trust me, I have done this before. I have used Halloween as a setting for various stories. And when I haven't fully utilized these five themes, it becomes very clear. It feels like something's missing. And my readers and my audience have never quite gotten into it. But when I use all five, it creates a very colorful environment in which my characters can thrive. And it creates an opportunity to suck in the people that I'm entertaining. So use these five elements of Halloween and have fun creating a story uh, with it. Halloween is a fantastic time of year, no matter where you are. And it makes me really happy to know that other countries are beginning to embrace Halloween even more. Being as someone who lived in Germany for a while and was told, yeah, Germans don't care about Halloween, but then getting to see hordes of kids go about dressed up as monsters, uh, trick-or-treating, asking, Zissy Kitten, having no idea actually what trick-or-treating is, just knowing that they're supposed to get candy, that warmed my cold dead heart. <laughs> and it's only been growing since then. So Halloween is fantastic. Utilize it in your stories where you think it's appropriate, but make sure that you use those five elements of horror, levity, food, family and friends, and reckless abandon. So that is all the writing advice that I have for, the, for this rather long video about Halloween. <laughs> if you're looking for more writing advice, then please go check out our podcast, Camille's Har Harem, found on Podbean, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, The Works. We also have plenty more episodes here on YouTube. And if you want to become part of our writing community, then please join us over at our subreddit or our Discord. Links are in the description below. Thank you for joining us on this spooky adventure that we call writing. And until the next video, y'all, juice.